In this video, we're going to discuss the general steps involved in smooth muscle contraction. So recall that we have three general types of muscle. We have skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle is, of course, what we find on the skeleton. It's what we think of when we go to the gym. We're moving the limbs. Cardiac muscle is the muscle of the heart that pumps blood throughout the body. And then smooth muscle is going to be very different in function. It's really going to be more involved in regulating the diameter of tubes. So tubes, we could think about blood vessels. We could think about the airways. We could even think about movement through the GI tract. So if it's in a tube of some kind, it's probably going to be smooth muscle. And even when we talk about the process, smooth muscle is kind of the oddball, kind of the anomaly. It's going to be very different than skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, which more or less are similar to each other. Okay, And it turns out that rather than just having a bunch of voltage-gated sodium channels that initiate the contraction, there's actually three different ways that we haven't seen before that we would initiate contraction of smooth muscle. So let's now go and talk about the three methods by which we can activate smooth muscle contraction. The first method by which we can induce smooth muscle contraction is through what's called a stretch channel. So blood vessels have this intrinsic property where they will maintain blood pressure through the vessel. And so if you have a significant amount of blood that starts going through a vessel, that will cause the blood vessel walls to stretch. I mean, if you have more fluid going through that vessel, it's going to stretch the walls. And so to keep blood pressure more or less constant, the smooth muscle will contract to sort of shrink the blood vessel back down. Okay? It's sort of a negative feedback system because if too much blood's going through a vessel, it'll cause the vessel to stretch. And so that will activate the stretch channel and ultimately that'll induce the smooth muscle to contract and then it'll sort of constrict back down to its original position. Okay? And whenever you have activation of a stretch channel, which is a mechanoreceptor, you'll have calcium influx into the cell, okay? into the smooth muscle cell. So that's the first method by which we can activate smooth muscle. The second way we can activate this muscle is through catecholamines such as epinephrine. So a lot of your smaller blood vessels, so arterioles, let's say, are sensitive to epinephrine. And so if epinephrine binds to receptors, it will induce the smooth muscle to contract. And the way that epinephrine actually functions is through what's called an adrenergic receptor. So when epinephrine binds to the adrenergic receptor, you'll actually get activation of a G protein, Okay. And that G protein in turn activates this enzyme called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is an enzyme itself, and when it becomes activated, it converts ATP into this important molecule called cyclic AMP. Okay. So ultimately, when epinephrine binds here, you get production of cyclic AMP. So that's catecholamines. The third way is through antidiuretic hormones. So antidiuretic hormone's other function is to induce vasoconstriction, which involves smooth muscle contraction. And so antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is going to bind to the ADH receptor, and that's also going to activate a G protein. But in the case of antidiuretic hormone's receptor, that G protein will activate another enzyme called phospholipase C. Now phospholipase C's action is to convert this membrane lipid, PIP2, into DAG, which we don't really care about for this purpose, and inositol trisphosphate, or IP3. Okay? So ADH, also called vasopressin, is going to induce the production of IP3. Now what we see here in all three of these different mechanisms, whether it's the myogenic mechanism for the stretch, catecholamines, or antidiuretic hormone, they each lead to the production of a different intracellular second messenger. In the case of stretch channels, you get influx of calcium. In the case of catecholamines, you get production of cyclic AMP. And in the case of antidiuretic hormone, you get the production of IP3. In any one of these three cases, these second messengers converge on the smooth muscle cell's sarcoplasmic reticulum. And just like skeletal or cardiac muscle, this sarcoplasmic reticulum is loaded with calcium ions. And so whether you have intracellular calcium here, cyclic AMP or IP3, all three of these second messengers trigger the SR to release this calcium into the cytoplasm of the cell. And so we get a flood of intracellular calcium. All right. 
Now we're going to see some other things where smooth muscle contraction is very different still. So rather than calcium binding to troponin or anything like that, which occurred in both skeletal and cardiac muscle, calcium now binds to a calcium binding protein called calmodulin. Okay? So calcium is going to bind to this protein called calmodulin, and that's going to activate calmodulin. Now, in all three muscle types, we have to ultimately have myosin form a cross bridge with actin. But unlike skeletal and cardiac muscle, here in smooth muscle, myosin is ultimately activated through phosphorylation. That's very different. And so when you have this calcium calmodulin complex, what it's going to do is it's going to bind to this myosin light chain kinase. This is an enzyme, myosin light chain kinase. When calmodulin calcium binds to it, it activates it. So notice here, without the calmodulin attached to it, it's inactive. But as soon as calmodulin and calcium bind to this enzyme, it activates the myosin light chain kinase. And having the name kinase here gives us a clue as to what this enzyme is going to do. This enzyme is going to phosphorylate the myosin light chain. So here we have an inactive myosin light chain. It's inactive because it's not phosphorylated. But assuming that this calmodulin calcium complex is bound to the myosin light chain kinase, this kinase will then phosphorylate the myosin light chain. And you see it phosphorylated down here. And of course, now it's been activated. So now we have active myosin light chain. And it's actually this protein right here, the myosin light chain, that's actually going to bind to actin. And that's going to give us cross bridge formation. Okay? And that ultimately leads to the smooth muscle contraction. And one thing to understand is that this phosphorylation of the myosin light chain and subsequent cross bridge formation with actin, that's actually happening hundreds to thousands of times in a given smooth muscle cell. And so all those events simultaneously combined lead to the contraction of that smooth muscle cell. Okay? And when a bunch of smooth muscle cells contract, then you get constriction of that blood vessel. If this were to happen in one of the bronchial tubes, then it would cause those bronchial tubes to constrict. So let's do a quick recap here. We can activate smooth muscle to contract through one of three mechanisms generally, either through the myogenic mechanism, which involves stretch of the blood vessel. This is a negative feedback system to bring it back to the regular baseline diameter in which we can get influx of calcium. We can also activate it through catecholamines and antidiuretic hormone, and ultimately these lead to two other second messengers, IP3 and cyclic AMP. Along with calcium, these three second messengers will trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the cytosol, which causes an increase in intracellular calcium. That calcium then binds to calmodulin, activating it. And then this calcium calmodulin complex then binds to the myosin light chain kinase, activating it. And then this kinase, while activated, phosphorylates the inactive myosin light chain, which of course activates the myosin light chain, allowing it to form a cross bridge with actin. Okay? So really in the end, with skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscle, all three of them actually involve a cross bridge formation to induce contraction. But as you can see here, the mechanism for smooth muscle is extremely different. Hopefully this made sense. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.